morning and welcome to St. Andrew's United Church. As always, it is such a joy and a privilege to join together in worship and in praise, in singing, in prayer, and in word. And we're very fortunate this morning to welcome two of our close friends back, Matt and Betty. It's uh, great to have some more voices, less of me in the microphone, and more of the great people that we have here. So. It's wonderful to uh, welcome you back along with Sean and Katie and Greg. This Sunday, we celebrate in Indigenous Peoples Day of Prayer. And in doing so, the United Church of Canada and St. Andrew's United Church recognize the Honodashi and the Anishabi people as the traditional peoples of this territory. We acknowledge and give gratitude to the Indigenous peoples for sharing these lands in order for us to continue our ministry of God's calling in this place today. Let us worship God. like the one, like the one who welcomes us here. In the words heard, tunes felt, and in silence experienced, we are ready to offer all that we have in hope. And so come and rejoice and worship with the Holy One. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, come to us in our doubts and in our frustrations, for we may feel unable to fully immerse ourselves into the possibilities that you have to offer, not only ourselves, but all as well. And so today, allow us the courage and the strength to live not only for ourselves, but for all who are in need of your love and your presence in this world. We often say that we are so beaten down by life, O oh God. We can see shadows all around us and shrink away from your light and our fears. How easy it is for us to turn our backs on others simply because, well, they don't agree with how we view the world or we don't believe that they have anything positive to offer. Our attitudes and our actions often reflect anger and host host hostility rather than compassion and hope. 
and particularly on this Indigenous Peoples Day of Prayer. We recognize, O oh God, that not only our forebears, but even we ourselves have not moved and been open towards reconciliation and dialogue and living in right relationships. Help us, O oh God, open to ourselves to the possibility of doing what is right. Heal and restore us and all peoples to wholeness and hope. And always give to us the courage to follow in Christ's way. For it is in his name that we pray. Amen. spirit in the love and in the peace of a reconciling Christ may the peace of Jesus Christ be with you all you. let us share this greeting of peace with one another within our midst within our hearts within our lives and all around the world amen as we continue on this morning with readings from the book of Genesis, we continue on with this fascinating and quite, well, out there story of the trials and tribulations of Abraham, Sarah, and all those who are a part of their lives then and in the future as well. This morning we're reading from Chapter 21, verses 8 through 21. We recall that Isaac, whose name means humor or laughing out loud, is the son of Sarah and Abraham, a miracle child who they thought they would never be born. And so let us listen for what God might be speaking to us and that we need to hear so that we may share it in our lives today. When Isaac grew up and was about to be weaned, Abraham prepared a huge beast to celebrate the occasion. But Sarah saw Ishmael, you know, the one son that Abraham had with her Egyptian servant, Hagar. Well, she saw Ishmael making fun of her son, Isaac. And so she turned to Abraham and demanded, Abraham, get rid of that slave woman and that son, he's not going to share the inheritance of my son, Isaac. I will not have it. Well, this upset Abraham very much because Ishmael was his son as well. But God told Abraham, do not be upset over the boy and your servant. Do whatever Sarah tells you, for Isaac is the son through whom your descendants will be counted. But I will also make a nation of the descendants of Hagar's son, because he is your son too. So Abraham got up early the next morning. He prepared food and a container of water and strapped them on Hagar's shoulders. And then he sent her away with their son, and she wandered aimlessly in the wilderness of Beersheba. But when all the water was gone, she put the boy in the shade of a bush. Then she went and sat down by herself about a hundred yards away. I don't want to watch the boy die, she said. 
as she burst into tears. But God heard the boy cry, and the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven, Hagar, what's wrong? Don't be afraid. God has heard the boy crying as he lies there. Go to him and comfort him, and I will make a great nation from his descendants. Then God opened Hagar's eyes, and she saw a well full of water. And she quickly filled her water container and gave the boy a drink. And God was with the boy as he grew up in the wilderness. He became a skillful archer, and he settled in the wilderness of Paran. His mother arranged for him to marry a woman from the land of Egypt. Herein is wisdom. Thanks be to God. Growing up and, and watching TV, particularly hour-long programs, it wasn't uncommon uh, for there to be a short recap of what had happened in the episode before or the episode before that, so you could continue to follow along with the story if you would happen to, to miss an episode, because, of course, back in the old days, we, we didn't really have VCRs or digital recorders or anything else. There was nothing on demand. If you did not sit down and watch it at the prescribed hour, on the prescribed day, on the same channel over and over again, you just missed out. And so there'd be these short recaps, and, and of course they still do short recaps on many programs today. And this is a particular story, the story of Abraham and Sarah and all their goings on. There needs to be almost a short recap every time that we preach on it, just so everyone can imagine and understand how the story flows. From that first call that Abraham receives from God. And he and Sari, they begin to travel. They travel with their nephew Lot and with Abraham's father. And they travel through a wilderness and try to find the place where God is going to make a great nation out of the family and the lineage of Abraham. But of course we know Abraham and Sarah in following God's call, they know that they are both old. And they both believe deep within themselves that they're never, ever going to have children. Heck, they're 90 plus years old. We know that the clock has stopped ticking by that point, not just for one partner, but both partners. At least I think so. Sarah believing that they need someone to carry on 
to carry on their name and their calling after they die, well, she has a plan. And so she offers her husband the chance to sleep with Hagar in the hopes that Hagar produces a son. Hagar, of course, being Sarah's servant. Well, lo and behold, Hagar becomes pregnant. And then Hagar believes that she's found new standing within this family unit and begins to be very nasty and catty towards Sarah. Well, Sarah says to Abraham, Look, Abraham, what have you done? Well, forget about the point where I asked you to sleep with my servant, but now it's all your fault, Abraham. What have you done? Not my fault, says Abraham. You deal with her. And so Sarah begins to plot her revenge. Hagar is so ill-treated by Sarah that she runs away before she gives birth to Ishmael. But an angel tells her to go back and tough it out. Tough it out and everything will be okay. Well, she has her son. Abraham is thrilled. And he names this son Ishmael. Well... If we think that's a bit of a story, here comes the next plot twist. You might remember last week, God tells Abraham that he's going to have a son with Sarah. And Abraham laughs it off. Not only Abraham, but Sarah, who's hiding in the tent, overhearing the conversation that her husband is having with the three strange travelers. She begins to laugh hysterically as well. But God then tells Sarah that she's going to have the baby. And Sarah, she just can't believe it. Laughing and laughing. We're told laughing right into the face of God. Well then, if that's not enough, Abraham then goes on trying to save the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. Because remember, his nephew, Lot, was traveling with him originally. But we haven't heard a lot about Lot lately because we're so involved with the Hagar, Sarah, Ishmael story. So Abe goes off to save Sodom and Gomorrah, and his nephew, Lot, gets involved there. Tragedy strikes, the cities are destroyed. Lot gets drunk, his daughters are left without any opportunity of marrying. And so to carry on the name, they have relations with an intoxicated lot, so the family line will be preserved. Success for both. They both become pregnant. Now you say, really, Stephen? Is this really part of our sacred scriptures? It's all there. Well, now we turn back to Abraham. Because Sarah, well... Sarah is a wonderful woman. We remember that Abraham gives Sarah to King Abimelech. Abraham said that Sarah was his sister to save his own skin. In fact, Sarah became part of the king's harem just so Abraham would not face scrutiny. And so the king has a dream and God states that everyone the king holds dear would die if the king actually lays a finger upon Sarah. Well, the king gives Sarah back to Abraham along with a whole whack of livestock, servants, and money. And then Sarah has Isaac. No need for Hagar and Ishmael anymore. Hey, hey, honey, why don't you just kind of get rid of these extra people? We're rich now. We've got our own son. We don't need all this stuff. And so Abraham wakes up early in the morning and he quietly goes into the servant's tent where Hagar and Ishmael are sleeping. And he gives Hagar some bread and some water. And she says, it's time for you and Ishmael to leave. Hagar and Ishmael wander through the desert the bread is gone. The water is gone. Hagar puts her son under a bush, a small tree, to die. Again, an angel appears. Hagar, what's wrong? Don't be afraid. 
God has heard the boy's cries over there. Get up, pick up the boy, take him by the hand, because I will, he, God, will make a great nation from him. And then we're told that God opened her eyes and she saw well. And she went over, filled the flask, and gave the boy a drink. Like sands through the hourglass, so are the days of our lives. I mean, if our faith tradition does not read like an episode from a prime afternoon time drama, I'm not sure what does. But there's less impetus put on the drama and all of the complicated nature of relationships between the people who are a part of the story, then when God gets involved, for when God gets involved, it is a simple and it is a direct way for people to open their eyes and see the reality in all its folly within their midst. I mean, has anyone ever told you, come on, open your eyes. It's so plain to see what's going on here or what's happening over there. I mean, if we open our eyes, there's a great deal of hunger, mental illness, accidents, poverty, racism. If we open our eyes, we see actually the very minute time and energy that has been put into any type of reconciling relationships with indigenous peoples. Oh yes, we can get, you know, snippets in the news about how this government or this group of people are doing good things here and here, and I'm not saying that that's not important. But if we look at a conscientious effort among all the peoples of Canada, all the peoples whose heritages come from places other than that of those who were here with the Creator. If we truly opened our eyes, I think we would realize that we haven't paid it much mind. Sometimes we need to open our own eyes to the relationships that we have and what others offer as silent approval. I'm not sure about you, but there are times that I don't want to see what's right before me in front of my eyes. I mean, the unpleasant realities of life that we toss out into the desert so that we don't have to worry about it. Somebody else can worry about it. Somebody else can feel bad about it. I really don't want to invest that from myself right now because I'm kind of busy over here. And this feels a lot more comfortable, so, you know. But the key words, the powerful words, the life-giving words that are offered through the angel of God. Don't be afraid. Get up and open your eyes. And when you open your eyes, what is it that you actually see? What is it that we need to do? And what is it that we need to address when we are truly willing to see what is in our midst around us? You see, I mean, Hagar, my heart goes out to this woman who has been used, uh, quite frankly, abused, by, Hera, uh, by Abraham and Sarah. There she is, left with this boy to fend for herself in the desert, uh, with no hope, runs out, is prepared to see, or at least not see, but at least listen to her child die. But right there, in front of her, 
something that she could not see within the midst of her anger and frustration and hurt and pain was a well. She went over, filled the water flask, and the boy drank. Yeah, 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 preacher. Another sermon. Open your eyes. Get off your seats. Get your butts in gear. Let's get to it. If we really want to prove that we're good Christians, disciples, followers of faith, yes, open our eyes. Let's become absolutely 100% engaged in everyone else and do it for the right reasons and for the glory of God. Come on, let's make a difference. Let's give more money, more resources, more time thinking of others. And let's not even think about ourselves for a moment. You see, life is the continued dramatic presentation that we are caught up in. And so often we feel so powerless to change the story or the narrative of that drama. What is one common thread between all daytime television or, or salacious movies or shows? Deceit, deception, covetousness, lying, conniving, lusting, stealing, backstabbing, I mean, it's not even drama on TV. We see it in the lives of others broadcast on news networks, in politics, and in the reality of relationship shows. Love Island, they call it. I don't know. Oh, but that's me being judgy, right? And you've all heard me be, say before, I'm not all that into judgment because I, my own glass house can't stand the judgment that's being thrown back at me. So forgive that. We'll try and edit that Love Island thing and me being judgy out of this sermon. <laughs> oh, no editing, Katie says. All right, well, I guess it has to live with me. You've actually heard me judge something. Deceit, deception, covetousness, lying, conniving, lusting, stealing, backstabbing, all of those things exist within the drama of life. And at some point, they've existed in our own lives and those around us as well. But we are called to something else, though. Before we can tell anyone else to open their eyes and see what is clearly before them, we have to be willing to stand in our own mirror and truly open our eyes to the frailties and the misgivings and the challenges that we have ourselves. Because there's no point in standing upon a soapbox and shouting out to the world about how you should do this or how you should do that, or to family, friends, and neighbors, oh, you need to do this, you need to do that, you need to do that unless we come to grips with who we truly are ourselves, all of our warts, all of our challenges, all of the things that we'd love to change but are not willing to hear and work on. Open your eyes. And when we get to the point where we can open our eyes, that is when the narrative of this drama of life that we are a part of can change. The narrative can be shifted towards all of those things that just seem absolutely ridiculous to us, yet we continue to get caught up in towards something else that is far more positive, life-giving, compassionate, and loving. But to open our eyes means that we have to take a risk. And in that risking, we are provided insight into what is already before us. 
that we find ourselves unable to see. Because right in front of us, there is a well of life. A well that is overflowing with possibility. A well that overflows with inclusion, understanding, peace, acceptance, forgiveness, hope, love, transformation, reconciliation, and more than anything else, the incredible wonder of resurrection. Don't be afraid, the angel said. God opened her eyes and she saw a well. She went over, she filled the flask of water and gave it to the boy. In the midst of despair and loneliness and pain, there was an overflowing well that was there all along. Thanks be to God. Amen. possess all beginnings and all endings. In the morning you are the cradle of the world, and in the evening you are the world's comforter. You are the morning dew kissing the buds of the flowers, and the evening mist rising through the falling leaves. You are the early sun announcing the dawning of a new day, and the twilight whispering the secrets of another. You, O oh God, possess all beginnings and endings, all failings and risings, all living and dying. For all of your people, all of your creation swells with the rhythms of life and death and rebirth, the whole story of resurrection. These rhythms compel us to sing and to laugh and to dance and to dream. And we also sing of sorrows born despite anguish, but also of joys known despite fear. We laugh at mistakes made in our weakness and at the changes begun in our strength. We dance to the harmonies of the universe and to the melodies within our own breasts. And we dream of unknown worlds on the strength of the world we know. O oh God, we stand as a people of faith, convinced not by the per uh, per oh God, we stand as a people of faith, convinced not by the persuasiveness of our own minds, but by the experience of our lives. We are convinced that all is as you say it is and that you do number every hair on our head and see every step that we take, every move that you make. We believe, O oh God, but when faith ebbs, we feel the pain of the world, and it splatters into the still waters of our lives. We know that within the drama of life, infants still die without drawing a breath. This summer we will hear of wheat fields burn while standing right for the harvest. Within our story of life, old friends will suffer from disease whose cures are years and years away. Weather patterns will uproot the lives of many. 
Innocent people continue to get in caught in the crossfire between governments. Workers have lost their jobs that they have held on for years. They don't know whether they'll ever be called back or when they'll be called back. And those who remain unemployed have, turned away, have been turned away so many times they've traded all hope for tears. Children, abused, bullied, rejected simply because they wear the wrong color of skin, speak the wrong language, live under the wrong flag, wear the wrong clothes, worship the wrong God. The list is so long, O oh God. But somewhere in the midst of our sorrows, you continue to walk and hold our hands, lift us up, mend and bind our wounds. You breathe new life into us and receive us as we are. For this we believe, and in this belief we find strength to remember and to respond. For you have numbered us from first to last, and we pray that you might grant us the compassion to count one another daily. Let us reach to those who stumble and break their fall. To the fallen, pull them back up upon their feet, and let us be caught when we are about to faint, so that we too might be lifted up when we are struggling to rise. And may the spirit of reconciliation and transformation still and remain a part of the very foundations of who we are as your people. We offer these in all our prayers in the name of the one who came, who lived among us, and showed us the possibility of a life-giving and loving way, and who taught us to pray in the words like Mother and Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. <laughs> Going forth, number 266, Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound, number 266.
go forth with open eyes, open hearts, open minds, openness to the world. We go forth knowing that there is a wellspring of life just waiting, waiting before us to go and to drink of and to offer to others. For it is filled with hope, peace, joy, and love. Go with God, go Christ, go with peace and Holy Spirit this day. Amen.